Right, can we have a show of hand? Who is actually using PowerShell? Right now? Yeah, right now. <laughs> Good man. So I didn't see this side of the room because I got distracted. Hands again, sorry. So we are doing some. Okay. Um, Good. Okay, I'm preaching partly to the converted. So uh, let me get into some of the slides, but I'll mostly do it through uh, mime. No, or demos. Oh, shit. Sorry, my mouse has died. Oh. Oh. Actually, has anybody got, I've got a problem? Has anybody got a USB to a hose converter? It's what I use for my live streaming. Oh, I could turn this into a physical comedy routine, couldn't I? <laughs> Oh, sorry, PowerShell, yeah. Okay, just, pardon? Something you want to share with the whole class? <laughs> just a, a quick slide to put, I've been developing since 1980 when some of you were negative numbers, I guess. Yeah, so I used to be a Unix developer, you know, the guys with no, oh no, that's Unix, sorry. Um, these days, I mostly write PowerShell for vendors, so... Um, normally control it come to these events but they're not here but some of my other customers like Parallels but Flexible used to sponsor these things so I mostly write PowerShell so PowerShell is what I do day in day out eight days a week oh is that a Beatles song oh so quickly go through these why do we use PowerShell why, why should you use PowerShell for troubleshooting rather than the GUI tools perhaps it's because I started my program career in the 1980s on a green screen with none of this GUI stuff that I like command lines but hopefully by the end of this, I'll convince you that you're know, using PowerShell for you know, troubleshooting, the sorts of things, you have know, user logons, or what went wrong there, that sort of stuff, it is actually much easier with PowerShell. And you might say, well, I don't really know PowerShell. The good thing is you don't really need to know it. In that, first of all, there are, there are scripts. So I've got a GitHub repo with 100 plus scripts, you know, mostly all about troubleshooting provisioning, that sort of stuff, in the EUC space, Citrix, Horizon. Haven't got much of that AVD stuff there yet, but uh, Jim writes that stuff anyway. But it's just an efficient way of doing it. And you think, well, I can't remember those commands. It's all that weird syntax, and I'll show you how we use command history. So you type a command once, you get it right. It might take you a few minutes to get there. Then as long as you've got a persistent profile, you know, either a local profile or this FS Logix, or of course we all use roaming profiles still, don't we? Have done since the Roman times then you will store your PowerShell history there forever. Yeah? Thousands of commands in mine. I think last time I looked, I about 7,000 stuff, because every time I move laptop, which I don't do that often, unless I buy, accidentally buy a Huawei piece of shit, but um, less said about that, the better. Then I take my PowerShell history from previous devices. I save it in OneDrive, so it's there. So I think, okay, it's something like get win events. Let me just search for event in my history. Lo and behold, it's there. So sake of a demo... Fonts, can we see the fonts at the back? Okay, okay, I'm going to baptise this baby in it. Oh, no, wrong font, sorry. Um, you don't have to laugh, by the way. I might actually get on with the PowerShell stuff. So if I want to search for something, last time I did anything with events, I can simply do a Control-R. How many people know about Control-R in PowerShell? This is going to, those people who are using PowerShell don't know about Control-R, you, you can thank me later. What is control R? Control R is search. No more cursor up, cursor up, cursor up, cursor up. Oh, it was 3,000 commands ago. Yeah? Control R is search. Actually stolen from Unix shell. Control R, backward search. Control S, forward search. As in, if you go too far, you can go back. So if I want... I know it's something to do with events. So let me type in event. Event viewer. I don't use, actually use that very often. Why? Because, well, it's a pain. I can see one event at a time. Which event log am I looking at? Well, it's application or system. No, wake up, there's 300 plus event logs now. And if you look at for interesting things, as in why did that user log on fail? Why did that user fail to print? Much as we'd like to get rid of printing. Um, how many are from end user organizations here, please? Oh, not many. Partners, people who implement this stuff. Vendors. And who else? Who else is left? People who've come into the wrong presentation completely. PowerShell. Mm. <clears throat> so if I hit Control R again, lo and behold, I'm back to a, a get win event. So I type that, and you look at that and you go, oh my God, what, what is that? Oh, I better not lean on that. Uh, I'll fall out the window. That could be quite entertaining. Not for me necessarily. But that's what, that's what I mean. Yeah. I don't need to type this command from scratch. I don't need to remember the parameters. Sadly, I do, because I use this sort of command every day, you know, either in my scripts, because a lot of what I do for control up, the idea we control up, I've been working with them for six years, I'm not, no, so I'm not going to control up garb, 
is that because I've been in the EEC space since 1995, no, no escape, you've been seen, <coughs> and a note from your mother later, lock the doors. Uh, lost my thread now, and that's why I shouldn't do things. When you get old, you tend to lose your memory. Well, I think you lose your memory, I can't remember. But yeah, because I've been in this space for you know, that long, I now had a troubleshoot problems, theoretically. So what I do for control up is, how do I recognise that problem? Okay, and how do I write to script to recognise that problem and to fix it? So it's the EUC knowledge going into PowerShell. So if I was any good, I'd have put myself out of a job because I'd have scripted all my knowledge. So the fact I've been working for six years and still haven't put myself out of a job, yeah, perhaps I'm not as good at this stuff as I thought. So the event logs, yeah, I mean, in the old days of MCSE, in fact, my last Microsoft qualification was an MCSE and NT351, I think, in 1998. I think that's lapsed slightly now. Um, but, you know, the, the exam answer was always, look at the event logs. And back then, there wasn't a great deal in event logs. There were only, effectively, three, you know, system application security. Whereas now, if we look at event logs, uh, where's it gone? It'll be the last window I find, won't it? Too many windows open. I did close them. I run my demo prep tool, which goes and pauses all the threads in any app which may go and uh, interrupt me. Uh, again, it's on GitHub if you want it. Now I've lost my event viewer completely. Okay, so we'll launch a new one. <coughs> so I can control C out of that event. Oh, and notice as well with if you think, oh, what's the event command? And I can do get command or GCM event. If you type it correctly, there's obviously some fault with the keyboard here. Those of you who PowerShell, as well as introducing you to Control R today for searching your history, Control Space. How many people know about Control Space? God, your value for money here today is immeasurable. What does Control Space do? It does tab complete on steroids. Yeah? It shows you everything that's possible. If we start with an E, for instance. Yeah? Oh, 212. No, okay. Well, let's have a star dot XE. Yeah? But, not all, I can navigate them with the cursor keys. Yeah, so I knew it's event, it's something that I've run before, yeah. Same with uh, PowerShell commandlets. Um, I know it's something uh, help to get help. Control space. Notice it's mixing X's and commandlets, yeah. So PowerShell, again, is one of those great things for helping you, yeah. RTFM, we all know what RTFM means, yeah. Read the manual. Well, with PowerShell, it's kind of a lot of it's built in. But anyway, if we go back to Windows events, so in fact, I was going to launch Event Viewer, wasn't I? But I got sidetracked by myself, which I'm very good at doing. So with Event Viewer, yes, okay, well, you all kind of know you don't need to, we won't look at individual events. Um, but the point is, down here on the left hand side, we've got 300 plus event logs. How many event, event logs, Guy? Good question. Thank you for asking. Get win event. Miners list. Notice again, I'm tab completing there. I could have control spaced again to show me all. Then and notice bottom left as well. It tells you the type. So list log, for instance, I can see. Notice that string tells me it actually takes an array. So I could have a comma separated list of logs that I wanted to to look at. But what I'm going to do now is faff around with the cursor keys. And then, yeah, no, I'm not going to count those. Yeah, I'm too lazy for that. So we just pipe it through measure. Yeah, kind of today's accounting. I can't reliably count. I can error about some event log. Oh, you know I was saying 300 event logs? 462 different event logs. So user's got a log on problem. Is it going to be in the application or system event log? Maybe, maybe not. Where is it going to be? One of the other many, many logs. Yeah, these are mostly nested under the Microsoft point of view. I think my goal by the end of this is to have driven everybody out of the room. It's two down so far, how many to go? Ah, oh, funny, I was joking. <coughs> that was a big choice today, actually, the T-shirt. I've got so many comedy T-shirts. I've only got two pairs of comedy trousers, but and these are neither of them. These are my serious trousers. So, yeah, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of event logs. Um, what to look for? Where do we start? Do we look at all 300? Do we look at it in Event Viewer? Even if we pick, you know, application, think it's fairly likely that something's going to be in the application log, then where do we start? We see one event at a time. The Event Viewer is a horrible, horrible tool. Sorry, Microsoft people, but, you know, it's true. 
So what can I do? Well, I can look at all those different event logs. So we, if you know it's in a specific event log, it's very easy. Oh, by the way, control L if you want to clear the screen. If you're too lazy to type CLS, you know, save you a few keystrokes. So again, if I go back searching for event, control R, then what I can do is I can start to look at all event logs if I want to. So I can look at an event log. This filter hash table. People go, hash tables. Oh, that's horrible. Again, you type this command once. Yeah, I'll make the slides available and the GitHub repo will be there as well, which is reference from the slides. There are scripts which basically wrap this. So I can say, okay, in that time, what actually changed? And what actually happened in terms of, sorry, the... Uh, the event log. I forget what this was. This was I was having fun with. Um, oh yeah, I managed to lose Bluetooth connectivity, which when you've got a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard is a bit counterproductive in terms of working. So I was trying to find out what had happened. So you can see a couple of examples of, of stuff that I use a lot in the troubleshooting. If you want to look, a lot of commandlets will take start and end times. Yeah. Now some of them you can actually um, just ch change quite easily. Let's get rid of this. Oh, by the way, control backspace deletes a word at a time. Yeah, don't need to delete a character at a time. Control left, uh, left cursor goes uh, a word left. So if I go for, uh, you know, if you want to say what's happened since, what time are we on now? Bleh, 11 something. You could actually say, you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, three down. Um, proper dates and times. But you do have to worry about red. Okay, I don't know PowerShell. Um, yes, I've got, a, I've got a bracket in there, which I shouldn't have had, I think. Don't run away at the first sign of errors in PowerShell, yeah? If you see, if you see something, it's like, oh, it's all, ah, I've got five errors. It's like, take a deep breath, look at it, and try and understand where you've gone wrong, yeah? <clears throat> and this is actually an error, but it's a good error. This is one of the annoying things about... Um, get win event is if there's no events that match, it's an error. Is it an error? I mean, we can silence it with uh, minus error action. Again, notes tab complete. And this time, well, I can control space if I want and I can pick whatever I want or I could cursor through them. So I could do that. It says, this at least is no error this time, but do I want to ignore all errors? This is where it gets a little bit dicey, particularly if you're writing scripts. If you're writing a script to automate something in you know, for a customer or in your own organization for 10,000 end users, I would suggest you don't want to ignore errors. Because what if it goes wrong on the first person and does the wrong thing, and then you do the same wrong thing to the 9,999 other users? Yeah, check your errors, but that's a different presentation. But what, what we can do here with get win event, and on my GitHub repo, is a script I use pretty much every day called Event Aggregator. And again, because I've used it in the past, I just search for uh, aggregator, not spelt like that at all. Well, a bit like that. So you can see, although it's got a, and again, even with scripts, so not just commandlets, so control end deletes to end of line. Yeah, I don't hit, have to delete. You see, it will actually then bring up all the parameters. Yeah, and that's true for any PowerShell function, any PowerShell commandlet. Like, as long as you use a param block, trouble is I get then start doing that with Xs. Why was it not tab completing for a, you know, if I run attrib.exe? Of <laughs> course, I don't run attrib.exe. I'll use something else within PowerShell. But you can see all the commands. And again, bottom left, you can see it actually tells you, you know, the type, whether it's a switch or whether it takes an argument. So the easiest one with this is, you know, I can say what's happened in my event, any event log. I can get specific if I want within here. You know, it takes an argument which says uh, providers, or I can search on messages. Again, I'm using regular expressions, so I don't mean to scare people. Regular expressions? Anybody happy with the regular expressions? Anybody unhappy? I knew you'd put your hand up. But they, are, they can be very powerful. And a simple regular expression to match the word guy is guy. Yeah, come on. They don't get any easier than that. It's not star, guy, star. It's guy, yeah? In some ways, regular expressions are easier than you know, simple pattern matching. So if I get, then go minus last five minutes, 5M, M for minutes. I decided not to implement months. I don't think anybody wants to trawl through. This passes through errors. There's some problem with this particular event log. I don't know what it is, but I don't really care. Unless I'm troubleshooting a 
USB issue, USB video. My, I must admit, my dongle didn't want to work, so I need to figure out what, uh, what's causing that. I'll just go and buy a new one, I guess. So what do we see here now? Let me just make that a bit... S I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom it, because obviously even you young people with your young eyes are probably struggling to read that. Read what? Um, so what we see... In this grid view, do you partially use grid views? A great way for, for data visualization. Any objects you get, just pipe it to out grid view or OGV, and you instantly get something where you can sort on any of these columns. You can add columns, remove them. Yeah, so on here, I can select which columns I want. Yeah, so if there's a particular column I'm not interested in, I mean, this will work across multiple machines, and you can remote to a machine. So if you can't, for instance, MSTSC to a box to see why you can't log on to it, then guess what? This supports minus computer name. So as long as you're running it as an account which has got remote event log rights, then you can go and get the event logs from a specific machine. But because I've run this on my local machine, Windows on ARM, which is, I've had it over a year, it's great, I can get rid of certain columns. Again, this is all built into PowerShell, yeah? Visualize your data without grid view. It makes it a lot easier. And something else that uh, is good, if I select a few lines, if you just control C, yeah? So you want to put this into a web search engine or an incident report or something, fire up Notepad. Hopefully I've run Notepad before, so it's not going to fire up the 27 instances I had open unsaved. Lovely feature of Windows 11. Oh, there we go. And then I can control V into that. Yeah, and I've got that same text that was in the grid view. So any grid view that comes out of the box with PowerShell. Yeah, another reason why I, you know, in the old days I used to use CSV to visualize things and open it in Excel because you've got export dash CSV in PowerShell. But grid view makes it so much easier. Yeah, so you can just bung the data in there. What we can all then also do, I'll actually remember to close this one, unlike the 27 other open ones. But then say we can filter as well. So it's, well, I'm only interested in messages which are to do with, let's say, message contains, and again, we get a fairly rich set. No regular expression, unfortunately, for those of you who like regular expressions, but contains does not contain. So I could say, let's see if there's anything to do with display, because I had some display problems. No display without a Y, no, there aren't. But again, you can see how it's easy to filter, yeah? But the point is here, what we're seeing, we're seeing things from different event logs, yeah? All in one place. So I'm seeing different providers. I'm seeing the WMI activity. I'm seeing security log, AAD operational. Yeah, so if something is hidden somewhere, so it's, you know, it's the consultant's old game, if you're troubleshooting a logon, this user works, this user doesn't, it's our favourite game as a consultant of, spot the difference. Yeah? Or there's an error in that event log, yeah, but is that error when it works as well? So it's playing spot the difference, which is actually something I'm working on script-wise as well. So you can say, why are these two machines different? Yeah, and there are various scripts in my GitHub already for that. So that's the event log, there's a rich set of information. Because if you have a problem and you say to the person, what time did it happen? Well, about 10 to 12. You can say, right, okay, well, I'm going to look for events which started at you know, 11.45. So you can have a, you know, but you can do, it doesn't have to be today. It could be three days ago, depending on something you want to share with the whole class. No? Thank you. <coughs> I guess it's a good joke. So with, I think people need a good joke every now and again, other than my trousers. But, you know, depending on how far your event logs go back, you know, you can say, oh, I had a problem yesterday morning. Well, why did you leave it? Well, I, I was too busy working. OK, well, 11 o'clock yesterday morning. As long as your event logs are big enough, and that's one of the other things I would suggest, make your event logs nice and large size-wise, yeah, 100 meg plus. For the main ones, not all those 462 or however many I had, um, but certainly some of the key ones. Security especially, because what I'll, I'll show you next is how many people use process auditing you know, when you turn on process auditing and it gives you a Windows event that says, oh, yeah, this process was created. This was the parent process. It was created at this time with these arguments. How many people use that? Oh, third takeaway from today, process auditing. There was such a wealth of information in there, yeah? So if you go and look at an event log, 
in security in events 4688 and 4689. Not that I'm sad or anything and remember those off the top of my head. Um, so if we go and look at this 4688 event, it's very, very interesting as events go. Yeah, it's one of my favourites. Anybody else got a favourite event? When I worked at AppSense, I used to interview people and ask for their favourite registry key. It wasn't necessarily so they'd name a key, which some people did. It was more, oh, we don't like the registry. Oh, it's a bit scary. It's like, well, we virtualise it and have this. Okay, yeah, okay, perhaps this job isn't for you. So a 4688 event tells you basically the new process name, who created it, what the ID was. So I've got full auditing, yeah? So people running Sysmon here from SysInternals for system monitoring. It's a good security tool. Um, but you don't need that. I mean, it's a free tool anyway. And it records a lot more. But with this, I can do a lot of stuff. I can do, a, a, I can do security, audits and tests. I can do you know, log-on analysis, you know, what ran, or you know, how many times have you sat there watching a log-on or just generally sat there and a, you know, a CMD or conhost box has popped up and you think, what the hell was that? Something ran very quickly and I didn't see what it was. How do I find out what it was? Oh, well, I go back and run process monitor and hope it happens again. No, with security logs, you've got audit of absolutely everything that's run. Why? Because we have 4688 events, and then the, if the process is exited, there will be corresponding 4689 events saying that particular process ID. Of course, we, all, we can all talk in hex, can't we, easily enough? Ten sites of people and all that. But the easiest way to convert a hex number, you don't need your calculators or anything like that. Literally just... Uh, it's come out of the Zoom. Oh, no, it's not Zoom, it's WebEx. Yeah? That's how I convert a hex number. Yeah? It's, and if I want to do the opposite, if I want to convert hex in PowerShell, then again, I can do control R. And that's how you do it. It's um, string replacement, except dollar $f isn't defined. So we'll say, uh, should we say 42152? Uh, yeah, we, don't, we won't put the dollar in front because that's a variable. And guess what? The variable doesn't exist. So that's why there's no answer. Because I'm incompetent. No, really? Guy, you're incompetent? Yeah, so same number. Yeah, that's the number you were thinking of, yeah? So easy to convert between bases because some things in event logs are the hex, some things are decimal, some things you don't actually know sometimes. But what I've done is put a, a wrapper around this uh, with a script, again, in GitHub repo, which I use mm, pretty much daily, depending on what my, my day entails. Uh, if we go back over here, uh, control L, control R, remember you're searching um, process durations, so you know, so I've got a space in my search term there, so I can say you know, what processes have fired off, in fact, let's, let's start something, let's um, oh, start notepad on fred.txt, and we'll give it a minus pass through so I can actually get... Um, the process ID back as well. So that's going to start notepad of fred.txt, which, which might actually exist in that folder. You never know. Okay, now it can't find it. I think I just lost another person, didn't I? Damn you. Oh, some, some one extra person walked in, though. So net new? No, still negative. So I've just started a process there. Yeah, so that could have been that CMD that flashed up or whatever else. So what I'm going to say now is, in fact, I need to search. or oh, control home, delete to start of line. Control N, delete to end of line from where the cursor is. Again, it's going to save you valuable keystrokes. What are you going to do with all these minutes extra you have every day? <laughs> right, PowerShell scripts. Oh, that's what I would suggest. Um, right, so let's go and find a, an instance of process durations again. So let's say, well, yeah, last three minutes. I don't know how long I've been talking. Too long, guy? Yes, I know, but... Again, on GitHub, GitHub repo, basically uses that get win event to look for those specific 4688 and 4689 events and then stitches them together in one of these grid views so you can then filter in the grid view so if i want to look for that notepad one so within a grid view at the top here you can do sort of like a global filter which applies to any any of the columns so if i put in notepad and zoom in so we all have a chance of reading it you can see the process was oh yeah good old notepad now is not just a simple Win32 app, is it? No, it's a UWP, whatever we want to call it, yeah? So it's coming out of 
uh, that folder. We can see what the process ID was in decimal. There we go, notepad fred.txt or txt. But then if we, I need to shrink this down so I can scroll across. It's difficult running at these zoom levels. So zoom across. You can see what the parent process ID was. Yeah, so what launched it? So if you see this CMD pop up briefly, you know, users will say, oh, this window popped up during logon and gave me a weird message. Well, well, I didn't read it. It disappeared. You can now see what fired what. So I, here we know PowerShell started Notepad. Yeah, so you can see whether it's a service that started, a third party, Explorer. <clears throat> How long it ran for? This is very useful for logon duration analysis. Was Control Up have a, a script that you can run Without control up, so all the scripts in the control up script library. So go to control up.com, go to resources, the script library there. There's 400 plus scripts there for sort of EUC, troubleshooting, automation, etc. Quite a lot written by me, but there are some good ones there. Don't worry, other people wrote them. And you, know, you can use those without the control up product. They're literally PowerShell scripts, look at the arguments, parameters, and you can run, run them. And there's a, quite a, a large VM off of one called Analyze Logon Durations. If you want to see where your logon timings went in terms of GPOs, mapping printers, uh, Explorer starting, all the different phases, it will produce screenfuls and screenfuls of information. So that's quite a useful script on there, which uses some of this technology. Uh, well, not let's say technology, but some of the information we get from the security event log. Notice, security event log, therefore, by default, unless you change it, which I would suggest you don't do, then you've got... Uh, only admins access to it, which is a good thing because if I put a clear text password in a command here, guess what? It would show that clear text password in my history. In fact, you know, in the event viewer, in a 4688 event, it would go, you know, if I'm passing it to net use, for instance, in a logon script with a, a username and password, it would show that password. You know, it would only be accessible via a local admin, but yeah, you're still recording that password, and it might be that the person who's a local admin, particularly if you're giving them a, a Windows device where you think, oh, what's the worst that could happen? I'll give them a local admin. <laughs> we trust our users, don't we? Then, and we can see here, actually, whether things are elevated or not. I think I started that from a, my elevated um, PowerShell window. I don't log on as an admin. I wouldn't do that, yeah, but I have a separate admin account. Yes, sir? Just clear it out. Well, interestingly, in PowerShell, that's built in with uh, the PS read line module. So the control R, which uses part of that PS read line module, doesn't store command lines mostly that it thinks have got passwords in. But it's very easy. I mean, if you want to go and look at your command history, so this is it. This is for four six eight eight events in the event log. But if you thought you'd got your command history, so I mean, the good thing about PowerShell, as I said at the start, is as long as you've got a persistent profile, so I've got a local profile, but my PowerShell history file is actually um, set to OneDrive. In fact, I need to, one thing with grid view, depending on what, if you put OK and cancel, I've, you have a minus pass through option for grid view. And if you've got any items selected, then they get passed through as a return from out grid view. So if we do see what's in the clipboard now, we get to clipboard, GCB. Uh, it hasn't put anything in the clipboard. Okay, that was a great demo. Okay, I'll work on that. Uh, nothing up this sleeve either, strangely. Nothing in here either. More to the point. Um, yeah, so you, your history, if I do a get PS read, read line option, you'll see there are various, and this is where the various keys are defined and so on, but you'll see my history file is in here. Which actually, yeah, is in my, I'm saving that. So that's where my history file is. So I can actually see you know, how big that is in terms of what's in it. Um, can't work it, this is zoomed out. Ooh, zoom, no, it's not zoomed out. I've just got big fonts. History save path. So there's my history save path. How many commands are in it? Um, Get content. Aliases, great for saving your time typing in interactive mode. Do not use them in scripts. Why? Because it makes it much more difficult to understand what is going on. You see GC in a script as, an, as a non-PowerShell person. GC, what the hell is that? 
get dash content. Yeah? Always use full command names, full parameter names, just make it easy. If not, for somebody else, you think, well, nobody else knows PowerShell. I'm the PowerShell guru in this organization. Yeah, thank yourself as you get older, when you come back to the script in six months, and you're like, who wrote this? Oh, yeah, I wrote it. Yes, what the hell is this? Yeah, comments, meaningful variable names, no shortcuts. Yeah? Then we can see how many commands have I got in here. Measure. 4,122, not as many as I thought, actually. I must have reset it at some point. But that's quite a few, and I can search all those. I can even look at them. I mean, at any point in time, if you want to, one of the nicest aliases is H, yeah? Shows me, you know, the history for that, just for that session, yeah? As in that PowerShell process. So you can see everything I've, I've typed, or everything I've run, at least. Yeah, some of this in this session, some previously. But when, when did I run that get hotfix? And this is interesting because if I want to cross-reference, if I want to, let's say I want to ping um, that well-known host there because I'm going to see when, you know, I'm, I'm troubleshooting, I want to go and have a look at firewall logs. Yeah, that's not going to work, but the point is, when did that run? Well, one of the things I used to do was this, date being an alias for get-date. Again, don't use it in scripts, but for every... PowerShell command look, if it doesn't find what you type in, it'll look for this with a get in front of it. So I know I ran that at 12.18.46. You know, do I know what time it finished? Well, I could put date around it. So I know between 12.18.53 and 12.18.56, I need to go and look at you know, network logs, firewall logs, whatever else on these devices. But what I can also do is I can use the history command, which is get dash history, but it's a very useful alias, which even I can remember, which is H, which I typed before. But if you want to see the last command, then history count. So again, it can be expanded if you want, which is what we'd use if we were using it in scripts. I can see, yeah. But by default, it's not, because of the PS1 XML file, it's not showing me everything. So if I actually do this, I'm now going to have to go minus two. Why? Because my command minus one is going to be my history command, yeah? If I then say format list, FL star or select star, show me everything. This is how we start to explore what you know, PowerShell command that's returned back to us. Notice now, I didn't need to do my date stuff around it because it tells me when it started and when it finished. And I can very easily work out the duration. And if I was in PowerShell 7, I'm in Windows PowerShell here. Why? Because most of the work I do for my customers is still, unfortunately, Windows PowerShell which is still very much alive. It's not being developed, but it's still very much alive because its, it's support lifecycle is tied to that of the OS, not to actually a you know, PowerShell product. So the latest version of... Oops, zoom that because we're in terminal. So I'm now in PowerShell 7, which my prompt tells me, if I actually manage to type something correctly, then I can see I'm in PowerShell 742, which is the latest, which is known as core, whereas if I'm in the other one, it's Windows PowerShell, which is known as desktop PowerShell. But Microsoft have done a heck of a lot of work making PowerShell 7 you know, compatible with or doing lots of tweaks behind the scenes, so your scripts that work with Windows PowerShell will also work with PowerShell 7, which is cross-platform, which will run on Mac and Linux as well. And it's a lot faster. So if you get a chance of using it for troubleshooting, use PowerShell 7. But PowerShell 7 isn't necessarily going to be guaranteed to be everywhere because you have to go and install it. Although third parties, so if, you're, if you've got a product, you can actually bundle the PowerShell 7 installation media as part of your uh, install, and that's perfectly legal as per the license agreement. Well, hey, there's a good idea. When PowerShell 7, one thing that nicely they've added, let me do that at the top, just so those people struggle to see over people's heads. In fact, let's do it a format table. Well, let's do a select star, in fact, or FT star. <clears throat> Notice we have a duration now. So PowerShell 7, you don't even need to work out that duration yourself by taking that number from that number, bearing in mind, of course, there's milliseconds. Well, in fact, there's probably 100 nanosecond granularity in these times, because you say, well, that didn't run for very long. That might have run for 0.99 seconds or 
seconds, so you can see exact times. But the, the beauty with, I mean, if we look at when I logged on, um, when did I log on? 13th. So if I go to process durations, I, it does actually take, oh, fat fingers, obviously not. Um, got our process durations. If we see, look at the arguments. Because I, used to, I was doing this so often for logons of users, I actually added a bit that will say logon of the user. Uh, so I've got logon of as an option. Get rid of that. Uh, my username, of course, is Zaphod, because we don't use meaningful names when we give users their usernames, do we? To make it more difficult to socially engineer and guess their passwords. So hopefully that will go away. Figure out, when, in fact, I'll give it a minus verbose which will give more information. About time you were here. So at least with minus verbose, you get kind of not quite progress. You know, write progress is different, but kind of avoid that with Windows PowerShell because it can be quite bad. So this is looking back at the logon of, looks like from these events, I can see scrolling past 13th of June, so I've not had to even you know, look at that logon. So now I've got you know, what happened at logon for the user. So, for instance, we should in here, I'll zoom in in a moment. Yeah, so here, for instance, is the launch of uh, something called Explorer that you may have heard of. Yeah? So there's Explorer launching. Oh, let's make this window a bit smaller so I can actually zoom it. Oh, let's actually not make it maximised. That would help. Just talk amongst yourselves while I actually try and get something that I can demonstrate. Right, so we zoom in again, so you can see Explorer, but what started Explorer? Well, user in it, started it, it started at 8.24, and I can see it actually hasn't found an end event for it, so it probably is still the same instance of Explorer running, since I logged on, what, a week or so ago. You can see that, and then we can, you know, the reason Explorer comes in here for other things is because Explorer has launched other things, i.e. for you and it, ah, oh, that lovely process from years ago that uh, sets up i.e. settings. Why do we need i.e. settings in Windows 11? So we can see actually that was quite a short-lived process. So if I unfilter it now, so I get rid of my filter up here, and we see the whole lot, um, so everything comes back in, we can see exactly what launched what during that logon process, and that was a week ago. I hadn't even thought ahead to, oh, what am I going to demo in, in Liverpool? Yeah. So here we can see with Explorer where it fits in with the logon process. Yeah. So above it somewhere there'll be win logon processes, and we can see, more importantly, you know, what the full command line was. Then if I manage to get over here, we can see what, how, what launched it. So this can help you understand the logon process, particularly if you're seeing things flash up and you don't know, what the hell is this? You know, where's it come from? Okay, let me look at the parent process. Let me try and understand that. What's the parent process for that parent process? Yeah. Now, if you've ever used, did anybody use the process tree in Sys Internals process monitor? Gives you a nice tree. That's the next thing I'm going to work on. This is actually a graphical representation. So it'll show you bars of, uh, not unfortunately the ones that sell alcohol, but the ones where it's like, yeah, this is nested under here because it started 10 seconds after this started. So it's more of a, a visual aid. That's what I want to do with this script, but I'm not very good with visual stuff because I'm from the command line era. Um, but I can't go, unless I've got a time machine, I think if I've got a time machine, I'll probably do something better than go back a week ago to when I logged onto this laptop and to run Process Monitor. But again, you know, you're running user help desk. Ah, uh, yeah, I logged on an hour ago. I logged on yesterday morning and it was slow. Ah, let me see what happened, yeah? But how do you know what's slow? Well, you compare a good log on with a bad log on. The old consultant, or even young consultants, yeah, there must be some somewhere. Consultants old game of spot the difference, yeah? So I've got this process in this slow log on that takes 72 seconds. And in this trace of a good log on, it takes two seconds or it doesn't even run. Okay, so why have I got that difference? Yeah, look at the parent process. What's running it? Is it a GPO that's running a script? Who knows? Yeah, this script can only help you so far, but maybe maybe I need to hook it into AI. <gasps> I said AI. I'm going to fall backwards onto this again, aren't I? Yeah, okay, that's all I'm going to say about AI. Perhaps troubleshooting takes the next stage. Yeah, I, I use AI for script writing as well. Yeah, because it 
helps me get over the some of the very yeah, the tedious bits you were saying. If I get stuck, that's when it tends to. They say hallucinate. I say lie, damn lies. Yeah. How do I do this? Oh, this. No, that's not going to work. Oh, yeah, sorry, I must have got that wrong. Yeah, you did get that wrong. Don't waste my time. But this is where, the, so this is using those 4688, 4689 events. So I you log on analysis, strange behavior because you can see what crashed. You know, exit code of non zero. So zero is false, which in a lot of Windows APIs means failed. But no, zero in other things in Windows is error success, which means it's good. And non zero is bad. Very confusing, yeah? You need to read the documentation, RTFM, to figure out what it is. So I can look in here and see you know, what things didn't uh, exit cleanly. So I can have a look for things which may have crashed. The things which crashed generally, uh, so we can say, does not contain or does not equal... Was it in hex? I can't remember. We'll find out soon enough. Yeah, so it's, it's picked up those which haven't exited. This will only look at a, I think, by default. Again, there are parameters that will change it. Never hard code anything in a script. Always put a default parameter in so that you can change it. So this, I think, looks 30 seconds before the logon time. It gets accurately from LSAS for two minutes afterwards. But if you've got a slow logon, you can just add an extra parameter in there. Again, you control space. Or do a get-help script name, because I write the comment block at the start, which is PowerShell help compatible. It will show you the full help with examples, or those little things to help the users, what I call ball ache at the end of writing this. Fun script is actually you know, WTFM, right? The stuff. So we can see down here, you know, something is exited with a 0x420 code, which is... Oh, look, it's some Lenovo something. Oh, a Lenovo, a Lenovo service. Good old Lenovo. Or even, yeah, and there's not much bloatware on here. It's not as bad as when I had a Dell. Um, actually, no, it's a vicious room that I had a Dell. Sorry. Um, oh, terrible. Uh, old enough to be a father. So we look for non-zero -exit, non exit codes. Generally, the higher they are. I mean, we can sort on exit codes as well. You know, we can sort on that field. So here's one which that looks to me suspiciously like having done this once or twice, something that would have exited and crashed. So that crashed or that exited after 0.01 seconds. That didn't live very long, yeah? And what was it? Oh, yes, Snagit. Great tool, but it does have a tendency to, uh, to crash. There's actually some other uh, process, Snag Priv. I don't know what that is. But yeah, the Snagit stuff is good for you know, screen captures and annotating and that sort of stuff. But it, yeah, it comes with a certain amount of baggage in terms of CPU and so on. But I can see then that that's bad. And there might be something in the event log. But of course, now I could then say, I could either go to my application event log. So given that it's 8.24 on the 13th, what I could then do is cross-reference it to remember that date, because I won't remember it. 8.24.55. So again, rather than having to trawl through event logs, uh, let's go back over here. Uh, let's get more prompt. Let's go process duration. Uh, no, let's go event aggravator. Aggravator, that's a good one, isn't it? Um, oh, 1 minute 33. Right, this will be the last live demo. I'll do some dead demos. Um, start... Um, what was the time? Does anybody remember? I told you to remember. You had one job. One job. 8.24 on the 13th. Uh, 08, 24, 13th. It will deal with those horrible US formats as well. Um, nice duration. One minute. Minus. Yeah. <laughs> It's got, why has it gone red? Oh, I'm, ju I'm just ignoring it, yeah. Do the, door, the doors are locked, there's no escape, yeah. What did I call it? I call it mine is bad only, yeah. So that will go back, as long as my events go far, that far back. Again, this bloody USB, USB video analytic log, I don't know what's up with it, I don't really care. As I suspect, that Snagit thing isn't to do with it. That's going back, as long as my events go back that far. Uh, let's see if we can find Snagit in here. No, we can't, fantastic. But here we see, because I use the minus bad only, then I will zoom in, don't panic. 
issue everybody telescopes, then yeah, level display name warning. Yeah, so I should have seen if it was a crash, then I should have seen it in here. Snagit's got their own error handlers. They tend to hide these crashes behind the scenes. You look for a Snagit folder in your user profile and you'll find a whole load of DMP files, which is uh, interesting. Okay, well, hopefully that's given you a, an idea of the sorts of things you can do. The key with these is the scripts are there on GitHub on my re repo, Guy R. Leach. I'll post it out on the uh, Twitter thing. I still call it Twitter. Um, so I hope it's been useful and... Yes, Neil? Uh, the process policy was really useful. A, is it enabled by default? And if no. not, how do you turn Group it on? policy. Group policy. If you get this process duration script, as long as you run it elevated, which you need to anyway, to get the security event log, actually has a minus enable option. So locally for that one machine, it will turn all auditing on. But if you're going to do it across all your machines, so I keep evangelizing about wherever I go, this process auditing is so good for log on analysis, crash analysis, security analysis. Yeah, Make your security log 100 meg and enable process creation, duration auditing, and command line auditing, which is a different setting in a GPO, across all your machines. Domain controllers, print servers, or oh, we don't need print servers anyway, with easy, do we? End user servers, SQL servers, put it everywhere, yeah? Thank you, Guy. I'll shut up now, shall well I? Done.